It's like they say, Pirim is nicht kayontif, in Kishin Tuches is nicht kein Klola. Purim is no pilgrim festival, and kiss my ass is not a curse. Simple invective like gehen drer, go in the ground, uh, which is of course go to hell, or ver geharget, which means drop dead, or very literally get killed, these generally take the form of commands, and they're delivered in the imperative mood, just as they are in English. So you tell somebody to get, to go, to drop, to kiss, to F something or other. It's the sort of thing that's found in every language. A real curse, though, is always a wish. It's always in the subjunctive mood, the less vivid subjunctive for you classicists out there. So all at saying zon der Heus fallen, all your teeth should fall out, na einer soll der bleiben auf zonweitig, but you should keep one to get a toothache with. Note that it's not specified that the toothache is to begin immediately. No, that tooth is there for insurance. The toothache isn't going to come until the person doing the cursing is good and ready to send it to you. And in the meantime, with any luck, you will sit there and you will wait and you will worry yourself into a heart attack waiting for the toothache to come and drop dead so that the cursor will not actually have to do anything. And this is because, as they say in Yiddish, a klola is nicht kein telegram, a curse is not a telegram, sie kommt nicht tun aus euch. It doesn't come right away. And that time lapse, that's what allows the cursee to do all the real work in the cursing and become complicit in their own demise. The more you think about it, the worse it's going to get. And this complicity is one of the things that led early Zionists to characterize Yiddish as a ghoulish language. Now, the kind of elaborate curses that you so often see quoted in books or hear on comedy records, these belong really to the performance aspects of Yiddish. They're jokes. They're along the lines of things like Zos Mehobentois and Taz, or he should have a thousand houses with a thousand rooms in every house and a thousand beds in every room. And you should sleep every night in a different bed, in a different room, in a different house. And you should get up every morning and go down a different spiral staircase in that different house and get into a different one of your 1,000 limousines driven by another one of your 1,000 chauffeurs. And he should drive you off to another one of your 1,000 doctors. Und er wird euch nicht wissen, was fällt dir and he won't know what's wrong with you either. Now, in real life, who is going to stand there for 10 minutes like Ayotz while somebody rains this crap down on their head? The only thing something like this calls for is an even funnier curse in return, because the line between invective and entertainment was breached a very, very long time ago. And all that a joke like this can do is call forth a better joke, or at least another joke, in return. Because like I said, nobody's going to stand there like a glomp and wait to find out what's going to happen to them. It's better, really, to stay in day-to-day -day life to keep things simple. So you can appeal to the general geographical knowledge of your victim and tell them, gay kaken afen yam, go shit on the sea. Note it's on the sea, it's not in the sea, you're supposed to be balancing there. This was originally, gay kaken afen leber yam, go shit in the liver sea, probably the congealed sea is a better translation here, but Leberjam, this is the Yiddish version of the Middle High German Lebermeer, the liver or congealed or frozen sea. And this is an old name, a medieval name for the Arctic Ocean, which was once believed to be virtually solid and almost impassable. The idea is you should go to the North Pole, pull down your pants, and never come back. And if you don't believe me, 
take a look at Shalom Aleichem, the famous Yiddish writer who explains in a well-known piece of his called Abletel Shir Hashirim, a page from the Song of Songs, talking about the Leber Yam, he says, the water there is as thick as liver and as salty as brine. No ships can pass through it, and anyone who somehow manages to get there can never come back. Serious Yiddish cursing, though, is a completely other ball game, and it violates just about every aspect of Star Trek's prime directive. It's entirely about recasting history, and a Yiddish cursor is very happy to change it. A Yiddish cursing can have a, a powerful retrospective, indeed a powerful retroactive force. So the idea underlying probably the most serious curse in the language, one that is never, literally never, used in a humorous or ironic way is Yamach Shmoy. May his name be blotted out, Yamach Shma, if you're talking about a woman. This is, this is dead serious. And in fact, it's so far beyond dead serious that if you get your wish, the person being cursed can't die because they never will have lived. The idea of a name in Judaism is that the name and the thing or person named are identical. And if you change the name, as people used to do when, uh, say, you were sick, you would change your name so the angel of death couldn't find you. You change the name, you change the essence of the thing. So a rose by any other name would indeed not smell as sweet in Yiddish. So by saying that somebody's name should vanish, should be blotted out, should be erased, you're essentially wishing that the person you're talking about should never have existed at all. And that, of course, means that their children, their grandchildren, etc., should also never have existed. They talk in the Talmud, you kill a person, you've killed the whole world, you're doing it here, but going backwards. You find a nearly opposite process in a curse that used to be considered just about the worst thing you could say in Yiddish, uh, and you never hear anymore for some reason, an evil spirit should take possession of your father. You can even go back a generation and say, an evil spirit should take possession of your father's father. Why you just don't say in Dan Zayden, I don't know. But you wouldn't think that up until recently, saying something like this in the wrong company would get you a strictly kosher knuckle sandwich. But it all comes clearer once you recall that we're dealing with a culture, at least on a folk level, that regarded madness as a hereditary illness, something that ran in families. So the idea here is that if your father was crazy, so are you. And your children are going to be crazy, and none of you are really going to be living in the same world as the rest of us. You're going to be walking up 8th Avenue, talking to yourself and waving a hammer, and that is just fine as far as the person cursing you goes. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to go to hell. You can just go someplace else. The Yiddish curse covers the ontological waterfront from non-existence to wretched existence to the one type of existence that is actually or apparently more wretched even than trying to defecate somewhere in the snow near Cape Dorset, and that is condemning somebody else to your own fate. So again, one of the worst things you can say to somebody in Yiddish Zost unkimen zaman mazel. You should have my luck. My fate should be yours. That is, I hate you so much, you SOB, you absolute piece of crap. I hate you so much that all I want is that you should be me.